Okay, well, we've got uh, got one um, uh, idea brought forward by Ewan here, and um, he's just mentioned that we're in the middle of a pilot project trying out the DNA storage with Twist. Happy to discuss if there's interest. And uh, then Dan also put something in here. We're looking into RDM systems and Venio, Dataverse, et cetera. I would be curious to hear others' input and experience. Um, so yeah, why don't we start with Ewan? Uh, that would be that'd be great if you could tell us a little bit more about Twist. Sure, hi, I'm Ewan, uh, Digital Preservation Manager at Yale University Library. Uh, we received a, um, a generous, uh, but not huge, um, donation for an endowment earlier this year for digital preservation. It's our first endowment for digital preservation. Um, and as part of that, they gave us some money we could um, spend right away. Um, and we chose to use that, use that to try out um, writing some data to DNA with Twist. So we've got, um, we've, uh, we've written or synthesized about 16 or 17 megabytes of data. Um, and we've got 40 copies. Um, can I share my screen? Let's see, I can. So this is what we received. Can you see the photo? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank um, you. So there's a little capsule in the bottom there lying on the, the packet. Um, we, we asked for 40 copies and that's what we got. Um, and our next step, I've just been talking with folks um, in Biomed who are going to synthesize one of them or some of the DNA from one of them to synthesize, like say, sequence the DNA from one of them just to confirm that what's in there is what they told us they'd stored. Um, and we're hoping to document the whole process um, pretty thoroughly and, and just talk about what we've learned. And so far, there's been nothing earth shattering. Um, we're also planning on keeping a number of these to be able to test them at different periods in the future. You know, two years, five years, 10 years, 30 years, however long someone here still wants to do it. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it was pretty painless. We provided the data, they wrote it. They're going to, uh, we're going to sequence it ourselves. And then there's some software that goes in between to decode the, the DNA, the G, C, whatever the four letters are, um, and turn that back into effectively binary. Uh, one thing that was interesting was uh, they don't yet, that they are working on it, but they don't yet have a file system um, for the for storing data in there. So we could only store a single file. Um, so that just meant we zipped uh, the, the few files that we did want to store in there. Um, and so there's a single zip file in there. Not, so, I don't know, any, any questions? That's really all there is. I, I'm curious if you sense that this is a direction that bioscience companies would like to move in as a commercial opportunity. Is this something that you know got involved in this right from the beginning because it was what they wanted to do? Um, so this is the, the same company that's in that video uh, that was shared in the notes. They, uh, um, I think the guy I've been working with is called Daniel or Dan. Um, and I think his company was bought by Twist. Um, they were, were based in Israel. Uh, and I think they were bought for this te this technology, um, and they, he's been told now it's time to really ramp this up and commercialize it. So they they definitely seem interested, and he is pretty confident that um, the price will be down to something like a thousand dollars a terabyte within no more than three years, um, wow. possibly two. And at that stage, for certain high value things, it seems like kind of a no brainer insurance policy where you make an extra copy for things that you know aren't going to change forever. The one I can think of at Yale is the Fortune of Holocaust testimonies. Mm -hmm. um, keep making an extra copy in a media like this that could last an extremely long time um, for a relatively cost-effective uh, total cost. Uh, seems like a bit of a no-brainer. Um, yeah. And so they do, but I don't know about other companies um, I mean, but if they can get the price down that low, I think it should be should be successful for, for certain types. Even film, I've been thinking it could be a good backup option for. Yeah, well, that's why I was wondering if you got a sense that this might become a competition between you know, genetics companies or 
bioscience companies? Well, so I, I don't know. Two things I do know are um, there is a consortium that are trying to um, uh, develop standards in this space, like for the, uh, the encoding standard. So how the DNA then gets represented as um, binary or the binary, binary gets presented as DNA. Um, and the consortium is made up of more people than just Twist. Mm -hmm. Though, if I am, I may be wrong about this, but I think Microsoft have, have been in the news about working with DNA storage. And I think they were just using the same group. So working through the same Twist technology. What was the other thing? Oh yeah, so I, in meeting Mrs. Only late last week with um, the folks who were trying to organize the sequencing at Yale, they were really interested and excited about this. Um, yeah. And they already work with Twist for other, DNA stuff. Um, they can get supplies and things from them, apparently. They're a huge company. Um, so, the, I mean, just the interest that they expressed um, may indicate that uh, you know, there's yeah. uh, potential there. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Eunice, a silly question. So, uh, bear with me here for a second. But could you walk through like what it's like to get the data to them? Like, what is the process? Are you are you sending physical media to them? Is this a, a network transfer? Like, how does that actually work? So there were two reasons why we wanted to do this project. One was um, to try out the technology, just to see what it was like in practice um, right now, especially. And the other one was to be able to use it to raise awareness about everything involved, um, from digital preservation to what we're doing at Yale and more generally, and uh, well, more specifically, and then also, you know, the sequencing process and, and the research area, yeah, all of that stuff. So as part of that, we want to publish um, um, materials so that people can learn about what we're doing. We can raise awareness and hopefully maybe get some more um, donors to support our work. Anyway, so because of that, um, we used examples that were completely open and are actually in the Internet Archive as well. So the Yale digitized things from Yale, all in the biomedical space, just so that they kind of relate if we're writing stories about it and so on. So that meant that uh, we had no qualms about just sending the data to them however they wanted it. Um, so we're also talking about no more than 17 megabytes here. Uh, so I just added the zip to an email and emailed it to them. That was a long answer to a short question. No, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, I, I think the approach makes sense to raise awareness as well, that sort of synergy and like just like a low bar in terms of other, other issues involved. But I was looking at the site and I thought, huh, I wonder how they actually get the data. It wasn't abundantly clear. So that's why I thought I'd ask. Well, so we also, though, it's, it's gone a bit cold recently. Uh, we're starting to do some work to try out that um, uh, that writing to film, um, just forgetting the name, uh, writing data to film uh, as QR codes on film. Uh, I, can't, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of the company. But anyway, they um, had a, a a, a next cloud instance that you could upload into and synchronize with. And that was the way that they received data. I imagine over time, it could be something like that. They also, and again, I don't want to put words into their mouths, but I think I remember the Twist folks saying that they would like to be able to license out the technology so that we could do the writing at Yale. Um, we wouldn't have to send the data out because I assume like everybody, they know that there are certain places that will never send their data out of their networks. No, I mean, that sort of makes sense. I mean, I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, one, one reason labs were all gravitating towards PCR is that it's, it's stone cold simple and it can be done at most labs, you know, and, you know, this technology, if you've got a, a large biomedical kind of entity on your campus, it would make sense that you could maybe do something like that um, or leverage that as part of the technology. So that's interesting. Thanks. Yeah, you're reminding me, uh, the conversation with the um, the people doing the sequencing, they, they said it's a PCR process and they said I should probably, I, I might know about that because of COVID and how uh, sort of in the media it is. Um, and they seem to think it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And there's something to do with 20 or 10 million base pairs or something like that, that I need it. So I'm gonna, it's all gonna be documented, I hope, but um, that need to be, sequenced uh, as part of the process and they said oh that's that's simple that's not much uh, hopefully it's enough and they were really intrigued about how they actually rebuild the um the data from the results of the sequencing because if it's something and again i'm going to butcher this entirely but 
to do with when they're working with human DNA, they match the results of the sequencing to a known good genome. And that's how they kind of bring the information together. And he was wondering how the process works with something that's completely unique. You know, the data is completely unique in the context of um, all other possible data. So I don't really understand that part and I hope to learn more about it as we um, continue through this. Oh, thank, thanks, Ewan, appreciate it. No worries. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, uh, there was one statement from a colleague uh, at UCLA when he heard we were um, gonna be talking about DNA storage in October um, and his, just his, uh, his enthusiasm was behind, uh, it's much more attractive to be talking about uh, exabytes per gram instead of terabytes per kilogram. <laughs> but um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so with regard to, um, just one other question, um, with regard to the sequencing, um, is that, I mean, is, it's almost like uh, that would be your strategy for fixity checking. Um, and is it even worth to is it even worth it to to fix the check more than once after that? Um, I assume you just want to want to sequence it once and be done with it. So what I'm uh, so a few things. One is I'm told there are like countless, like not infinite, but countless copies in each of those capsules, like many, many, many copies. So if they've done it right, um, uh, it's going to be very difficult to destroy all the copies without destroying the whole thing. I mean, destroying the whole thing would be easy. Um, so there's that. Uh, the other thing is we do want to test. Uh, uh, to my understanding is that it it's not necessarily going to be easy to reuse one of the capsules if you, you're taking it out to test or read the data out. So you're kind of, at the moment, throwing away that copy. Um, so the, we've got a number of, uh, of the capsules. We're going to read one immediately. We'll read one in different periods over time so we can do an update and say, hey, in five years, the copy we sequence now has it worked. The data's still there. It's fine. Um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, so there's that lack of risk. Uh, multiple copies in the capsule and uh, no, okay. there was some other point, but lost it. I want to raise a question. Um, so the video that Linda linked on our thread, the last presentation is by a Microsoft researcher. He goes into some of the error rates for the synthesis methods, and they're extremely high. They're like, at the low end for extremely slow methods, I think it was half a percent. And at the high end for the faster methods, it's as high as 10%. Have you, did you talk to the Twisted folks about what method they're using? Like how, like, how does has that come up at all? No, I mean, the only thing I remember hearing from them is the errors don't really matter because we have so many copies in there. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. So that's, that was the strategy that they laid out was just you make enough copies and you hope the errors are randomly distributed and not highly correlated so that you can then cluster them all back together and, and re like pull out your old data. Um, I was really curious about just like the computational limits of that because they were talking about making many, many, many copies. Um, each sequence has to be very short. So then you have a pretty hard like combinatorial problem to put them all back together because you have to basically cluster them again. Hope that you don't have dissimilar copies that are that end up getting clustered together. It just seemed very slow. So I was I was questioning like the long run limits on performance there for large amounts of data. Um, I remember the point I was going to say, which is that the extra copies, the capsules we got were very cheap, like very cheap. Um, so like, and once you've, uh, uh, I keep mixing up my words, uh, synthesized the first copy, making multiple extra copies at that point in time is, is cheap. Mm -hmm. um, but once you've gotten rid of that from your system, it, it, it's harder. Um, and yeah, interesting what you just said though. Um, I don't know. I think it's the answer um, yeah. or the response. Yeah, it's easy, it's easy to to essentially like just produce more copies, but if the data is bad to begin with, it doesn't help you. Yeah, I mean, I think depending on how we did it, like if we had 
uh, we well, we might want to get extra copies at the beginning and try sequencing at least one of them because theoretically, if it's all from the same pool that they uh, synthesized together, then every copy should be basically as uh, error prone as any of the rest. Um, so you'd probably want to try and test a copy as soon as you get it, and then keep the rest, keep the other copies. It's hard to talk about copies to keep the other capsules. Um, did you validate the data? Like, did you end up uh, extracting the data and then comparing it to the original? So we haven't done the sequencing yet. So that's the mm -hmm. next step is to do the sequencing. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to compare. And that's why we want to keep these extra copies, capsules around for, um, for years to do that again, see if anything's changed. I mean, they tell us that uh, there's a vacuum in there, the DNA is dry, and uh, it's been laser sealed, and the capsule is made of some, I can't remember what metal, but it should last in pretty much most environments for a long time. They always reference um, uh, like DNA you know that they've been able to extract that's tens of thousands of years old from dinosaurs or whatever, maybe not dinosaurs, but old um, animals. And that's in not ideal conditions. This is possibly the best conditions they could, could be in, being in their little capsule. So uh, theoretically, it should last a very long time. Um, but we want to be able to validate that. And so the first thing is to get a copy that we can then start testing in the future, which we've done. Got the copies. Well, we think we do. They, they tell us it's in there. Guess we'll find out. And did you say the capsule is a metal capsule, or is it silica? It's some sort of metal. Uh, I'm sure I have the specs somewhere. Well, I was um, just curious because I've never seen one, so I wasn't sure. And are you at all, is there any concern about, I, I think you may have just answered this, but of the degradation of the capsule itself? I mean, yeah, that's a, the degradation of the capsule. Mm. Well, one of the things uh, my colleague who's in conservation suggested is that we put different capsules, capsules in different parts of the library in different storage conditions and yeah. test them yeah. over time. So you can, I don't know if you can see this. Um, I mean, it's I put the pen there because it's so small and I want to give some sense of scale. Um, that's one just down here. And those are all the other ones stood up. There's actually a little uh, QR code on the bottom of each of them as well for tracking. Yeah. And I... <laughs> They forgot to send me the opener. Um, so I had to request that. It came out straight away afterwards, but they gave us a couple of it. It's just this little plastic thing that you screw on and it pops the lid off, I guess. I haven't done it yet. You know, going back to Dan's question, you know, and it, it sort of occurs to me that this, I mean, this is really a question for next week, I think, um, as it, so that we can get to Dan's other query about RDM systems. But I, I wonder if this begs the question, like at what point, like, I mean, the error thresholds is a really interesting question, right? At what point does that actually break down to this being a different object from the object that you stored? And at which point does it not matter at all? Not just because of the computation and the number of copies involved, but like just, you know, we're storing something in such a drastically different way that it, it sort of begs some of these questions in a really interesting fashion. And it'd be great to be able to test and look at where those thresholds are. Um, you know, especially since to some degree it's relatively simple, right? You know, you're storing a sim single object as opposed to a complex file system or something like that, which is, you know, ideal in some ways to test this sort of thing. Um, but, you know, like I said, that's probably something to tackle next week as part of that broader discussion. Um, but I do think that it's, it, it's, it's really fascinating, actually. Like, at what point is the thing not the thing anymore? Um, and, and how does that reflect the nature of the storage that we're using uh, is super curious. So that's my way of, like, thanking Dan for raising the question so I can distract myself this afternoon and hopefully, like, getting a question out there for the next time we meet. I would say the video that Linda linked was really interesting. The first two presentations, so hers was fantastic on just like the sort of preservation considerations here. The second was very simple. And then the third one I felt was like, let's bring the math, uh, the researcher from Microsoft. And his characterization of it, like I have a math background, um, it seems like you have a sequence of very computationally expensive steps that need to go into the sequencing side because there are errors for every copy that is synthesized. And so you have to make very many of those copies for each subsequence that you produce. Those errors could be correlated. If they're correlated, then even having multiple copies means that you, you might have the same error in all the copies. 
So in order to productize this, you would have to validate immediately after sequencing um, and then potentially resynthesize. The other problem was the performance of synthesis is really, really slow. So I think the highest level was something like 500 base pairs per second, which is not very fast if you're trying to write terabytes of data. Um, so I, I left actually being quite skeptical at that point. And I'm, I'm, I'm just really curious for next week's presentation. So um, perhaps by... Uh, oh, did Dan also did a talk at the Digital Preservation Coalition Storage Futures meeting a few months back. Um, and he was asked about uh, the speed of writing and reading as well. And he provided some reassurances on at least one of those that it's getting faster and should get a lot faster. Um, one of the things he mentioned, and I don't know how this relates, but the way that they want to bring the price of synthesis down is related to the technology they're using, which is based on the same technology as um, CPUs and microchips in general. Um, so they're able to miniaturize by using the same approach that um, that industry has used to miniaturize their things. Um, and that brings the cost down. I don't know what it does to the speed and I'm forgetting what is what he talked about in terms of um, what they thought he was confident they'd be able to speed up or not. Sorry. I'll look forward to continuing our conversation uh, next month. And uh, is there is there a small chance that you may have uh, gone through some of the sequencing by then, or what do you what do you think the timeline is for that? Maybe. I only had the meeting last late last week, and um, the guy over in uh, Biomed, I'm actually not sure exactly where he is. He um, said there's like a three week period from once we agree that we're going to go ahead to when it would be done. Um, because there's like a two week, you gotta get it into the slot. They're, they're processing all the time and then each one takes about 30 hours, but it takes a while to get that lined up. And yeah, so you said about three weeks. So if you manage to line it up this week, then potentially, yeah. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Yuan. No worries. So Dan, I think you had the uh, the next question up uh, in the chat with regard sure. to RDM systems. Yeah, so this won't be as interesting as Yuan's question um, which I'm, or point, which I'm really glad he brought up. Um, so we've started looking into research data management tools. Uh, we've looked at Dataverse and at Invenio RDM. Um, I'm curious if anyone on the call had experience running their own system. I also would add a note that we're, this is really just for acquired data sets. So the scale is very small. We're talking in the neighborhood of 100, not in, a, in the thousands. Um, all would be limited to the campus community. So they're not, it's not like public research data that's going into Dryad. It's not that. Um, so these cases are pretty small. And I was just curious to hear other people's experiences with that software or similar solutions. I don't know if maybe it would help for me to give some background on what RDM is exactly. I have used Dataverse, but um, we didn't set it up ourselves, so I don't think I have any useful information for you. But I've used it. Yeah, well, so we, we, we set up Dataverse. Dataverse was quite simple. It's basically a Java application with a database backend. Invenio RDM is very complex. It's like you would run a startup on it. Uh, Elasticsearch, Redis, uh, Postgres. I think it uses object storage for file persistence. So there's a lot of moving parts to that one. Maybe you could describe what you see as, maybe you could describe RDM and then what you see mm -hmm. as the, the pros and cons of each of them. I'd be curious to hear what you think of that. Yeah, so we're, we're still kind of in the early stages and I would say our use case is fairly limited. It would be for really for discovery and findability of acquired data sets. So the idea being, um, to sort of to facilitate like computational social social science, you know, we get a highly marked up uh, linguistics or um, you know like records of Shakespeare or something or Mark Twain project that kind of stuff. 
Um, and we want to be able to present it to users either who, who know that it exists to begin with, so make it very easy to find something that they already know exists, which is not easy to do in just like a generic catalog because it's just cataloging issues. Um, but also for students or researchers who are looking for something to study, to have a discovery platform on top of that that allows them to um, search by topic of interest, search by author, providence, uh, relation to other data that they're aware of. Um, and then also to you know, provide within that the access control mechanism for the data itself. So you would do the search on the metadata, but then when you get to your record page, potentially you can launch like a Jupyter notebook or something that, that has the data loaded in, um, in that environment already. So that's kind of what we're looking at. I will say neither Dataverse nor Invenio goes that far. They're not that advanced, but at the very least, you know, they do support, you do the search on the metadata, um, that's public, and then at, you can have access controls on the data itself. So that can be restricted to campus community or specific research groups. Is Invenio a newer product? I had not heard of it. And I know Dataverse has been around a while. Invenio is uh, the one out of CERN. It's uh, kind of quasi open source. It's, it's, it's really hard to tell because if you look at the commit histories for those projects, a lot of it is just fluff. There's no actual content to them. Um, but if you're familiar with Tind, Tind is kind of a branded implementation of Invenio software that they host. And, and what do you, from what you've seen so far, what are the benefits of Invenio versus Dataverse? Um, Invenio is, is more scalable, I would say, because it separates out all the different components. Um, so the, the search functionality is backed by an Elasticsearch cl cluster. Um, the database is used really just for administrative purposes, so you wouldn't expect to run into a big issue there. Um, but you could scale out the Elasticsearch cluster horizontally, so that's where I see the advantage. With Dataverse, it really was just Java front end, database back end. Yeah. Everything is going through the database, so if you run into that limit, like it would be hard to scale it. So for us, though, that's not really an issue because you know we're we're only talking about at most a few hundred data sets. I don't think we would hit that scaling issue. Yeah. Just um, knowing a little bit about uh, the existing efforts that are going on right now at UC for providing like a system-wide search and discovery, I mean, I, I would be curious um, whether or not um, either Dataverse or Invenio provided like a set of API endpoints or some way of programmatically interfacing between yep. that product and then, of course, the Ex Libris, like Alma product that's being used for the system-wide search. Have you looked into that at all? Or? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we've been thinking of like what the data model is here and where we want the source of, source of truth to be. And so the issue, I, ideally, everything goes through the catalog, right? So that's your source of truth. Um, the catalog is based in Mark. So some of the linked data elements are like harder to, to encode in it. Um, mm -hmm. At least that's, I'm not an expert on Mark or data site. I'm a I'm a programmer, but I, so that's that's this is high level. This is what I understand it to be. Um, but we talk about Alma essentially being the source of truth, and then having this other system pull from it, uh, maybe through harvesting or something like that, um, or just API integrations, and then being augmented with the specific metadata needed for uh, data set searches. So that would be like the data site stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I know with um, some of the the discussions I've been involved in with Alma is that there's this whole, uh, and, and Lee, I don't know if you're familiar with this too, but um, there's this whole set of, uh, um, I guess, concepts, but access, like gateways almost. It's like there there's the institutional like level, and then there's like the campus level. And um, depending on where the actual data is stored, different people can either view it or modify it or integrate with it. And it's that kind of, it just adds a whole layer of, of complexity on it, which is, it's good in some ways, but it also makes it a little more difficult to integrate in other ways. So, um, hmm. I know that institu individual institutions who are part of the, the, uh, the UC-wide system, we still have control over our 900 field, so you can still customize that way. Um, I know it's how a lot of campuses uh, yeah. they, they carve out those fields for their own personal use or institutional use. Yeah. I'm curious if there's anyone else on the call who 
um, does work with data sets or you know data management for re for for research. Any anyone doing that kind of work? Ours is very very small, being a law library, almost nothing. Well, I guess Dan, as far as this group goes, you're in a brave new world. <laughs> we didn't have anybody who could sort of give you any insight on that. Um, we, um, Lee, this is Robin Hi, at Robin. UVA. Um, we do have a group that I think is doing a research on a uh, data management system. So I don't know, I could possibly put Dan in contact with them. I'll find out if it's an active project. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I think I'm going to be one of those people that would say that could be great to know, uh, in part because recently was tapped by our, our new dean to go and kind of go shopping for something along these lines, although she was characterizing it as storage. So I'm not sure if people are looking for just kind of a broad range of storage that they can use for research purposes, or if this is something more in line with the products that you're looking at, Dan. But, um, yeah, I, I hate to be the person on the listserv that says, well, let me know what you find out because uh, that's not terribly helpful. Uh, but in our case, I don't, I, I haven't gone very far down that path yet because we're still waiting to figure out what exactly this, uh, the provost wants, uh, if this is just raw storage or something more. This is interesting because it makes me wonder if the process of, of research data management is happening more in the department, in, in universities anyway, within the academic departments rather than actually going to the library. Um, I, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I, there's a bunch of interesting points there. Um, I will say I, this first came to me over a year ago from the storage team. So from a mm -hmm. central campus, like central IT unit that was just getting a lot of individual requests from researchers saying, we have X terabytes of data, uh, you know, we're running, we have a server under the desk right now that has all the data on it, you know, help us. Um, so now it's starting to get elevated to the library. Um, I, I would say to Nathan's point about not quite understanding the requirements yet. I think that's a really important thing to do up front. That's actually where we're starting now. So we're in that requirements gathering phase because it first came to us as here's some products, please set them, set them up. And then now we're having that discussion of, okay, what do you actually want from this? Like where, yeah. where do we want to take this? But the fact that it's been several years since the requirements um, were set up where if you got a grant, a federal grant, you had to have a data management plan. And so I'm wondering what all of these grant funded projects have as their data management plan. Are they, are they managing their data themselves and not sending it out to the library, which is interesting. Um, we do stuff with research data at Yale. The university librarian has been hesitant to volunteer us for very much mm -hmm. until there's some dedicated funding available for the library, because uh, it's a new area. Um, but like our science library has been acquiring some data on behalf of researchers. And um, some of that has made it way, its way into our preservation system. There's, you know, it's stuff that we have to keep forever. Um, but we don't have, it's, yeah, it, we have, a, it, we're members of Dryad and we use that for um, research data, but those kind of acquired data sets, yeah, some of it is making it into our preservation system. Um, also, we're interested as part of the easy program, the emulation um, as a service infrastructure in, in doing things with research data to make it more accessible and reproducible, but um, it's not an RDM system. It's, it's quite a different topic, really. That, that would be an interesting future topic for sure. <laughs> Emulation, yeah. We'd, we'd be happy to talk about that. Um, yeah. Lots of interesting applications. We started getting into running uh, containers uh, of any era on demand through that as well, which seems to have a lot of applications in the sciences. 
I would say in terms of requirements, um, I mean, one of the things we've thought of as well uh, with regard to having data sets in our repository that, um, you know, that in addition to what's from coming in from Dryad is uh, just the, the notion of, you know, data that is sensitive and um, whether or not it, it can, you know, there's going to be uh, a really kind of like present requirement for being able to handle that sort of data and what sorts, you know, what types of different, um, uh, you know, security measures have to be put in place during throughout the pipeline, trying to get that data into the repository. Is there a completely, I mean, we've even thought of setting up a completely different or separate uh, instance of our repository for handling data sets like that. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we just know that uh, from, from recent working group, uh, research that there's a lot of that data you see um, many of the campuses have that sort of data and it's you know either it's it's acquired or it's being you know generated um, but it's still going to have the same as kind of like escalated uh, requirements for additional security so yeah, those are great points the, the other one that came up that was not immediately obvious to me was licensing um, the ability to basically to present requirements that are given by the vendor um, to users, like basically like accepting a license agreement prior to accessing data sets. Now, what's interesting there is that it's not necessarily a technical problem. Like in a lot of cases, you can go back to the vendor and push back and they have put, they have agreed to, to just get rid of that, um, which I thought was interesting. Everything's licensed these days. <laughs> and also it's more common now that the vendor doesn't even give you access to the data. They send you to their site. Wow. There's also a different use. Interesting. Case. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, we are at um, about eight of the hour. Um, Dan, thanks for bringing up that topic and um, Sorry, we didn't have uh, more to, to offer, but it, I think there is still some good group discussion going on. Um, does anybody else have anything else they'd like to bring up before we, uh, before we start wrapping up the meeting? Okay, all right. So, yeah, looking forward uh, next week, or I'm sorry, next month, we have our discussion plan about uh, DNA storage. If you uh, have some bandwidth to go through and take a look at the videos and read the paper, that'd be wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and thanks again, Ewan, for bringing that into this meeting. It's kind of the, the running up conversation. We'll have uh, even more time for it next month. Um, but uh, apart from that, I think um, that should sum it up. Leah, do you want to mention anything else? No, I think that's it. I can't wait for next month. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Good to see you. Thanks, Sarah. Take care.